Welcome to Still Entitled, the Adam Savage Project. I'm Norm. I'm Adam. And I'm Jen. Jen Schachter, welcome to the podcast again. Thank you. It's welcome good to be back. back. Is this your second or third time? I think it's time? my fourth time. Fourth time. I think so, <laughs> yeah. Uh, the last time you were here, um, I don't think we, we hinted at it. Mm -hmm. Actually, we've hinted at it for a long time now that you've been working on the secret project. And of course, it's since been announce uh we were recording this uh, a week early because as people out there are listening to this now both of you will be in washington dc when this goes up next tuesday yes, yes we are on our way to dc to in the largest schema participate in the week of incredible celebration celebrating and commemorating the 50th anniversary of the apollo 11 moon landing um an incredible human achievement and uh, I feel like it's sorely needed right now. Yeah, it's this, sort of a celebration of what we can do when we really put our minds to something good. Indeed. <laughs> and it's across the scientific community, across the, the museum community, there are science museums, art museums, uh, institutions all over the country doing their own thing to, to celebrate the occasion. And you guys are working with probably one of the most prestigious museums, the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum. I've heard of it. They, they yeah. have the stuff. <laughs> they have the things. They have, they have incredible, not only is it an, it in, not only is it an incredible institution, culturally, scientifically, um, but they also have incredible facilities for the, for the, for the, uh, the, the, the preservation and restoration of America's history. Uh, most famously, they've spent the last couple of years getting an endowment and getting donations to uh, repair and restore Neil Armstrong's original moon suit, the A7L uh, suit made by ILC Dover that he wore on the moon's surface. It's the first man to step on an extraterrestrial body. Uh, and uh, we're going to go film in that lab. We're going to go get some stories from around the Smithsonian. They have been, been super generous with us on Tested. So not only are we going there to participate in well, we haven't even talked about. I know. <laughs> the, 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 the big, the big I'm one. Over segueing, Norm. Yeah. So under segue me. Well, <laughs> next Thursday, you guys will both be uh, in the middle of Project Egress. Yes. Yeah, sending good vibes to our future selves when this airs. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> let's let Jen explain Project Egress. Sure. Yeah. So uh, we are undertaking a sort of, uh, I don't know, our own honorary hatch uh, replica, uh, an artistic replica. It's a sculpture of the original uh, command module hatch, which has a lot of historical significance, a lot of engineering significance. So the story basically is that um, Apollo 1 was uh, was supposed to be going to the moon, and they were on the, the landing platform, the launch platform, doing a routine test, and the uh, there was an electrical fire that erupted inside of the cabin. And the atmosphere inside the cabin was pure oxygen, because that's what they did at the time, and so the fire ignited really rapidly. And the, the hatch that was on that command module was designed to open in about 60 to 90 seconds in ideal conditions. Um, long story short, they were not able to exit from the command module in time. And so it was this really horrible tragedy. Um, and out of that came a need to redesign that hatch door with sort of minimal changes to the actual command module. So they had to reverse engineer and make this door that could be opened in three seconds. And this is this that last the, the caveat you gave is really really significant here because um, not many people realize how many different teams of tens of thousands of people were working on all the systems to get uh, to get us to the moon, and so the exterior, the interior, all the different pieces pieces of the command module all had to work in concert with each other, and so to pull off a door and then decide to put in a completely new redesigned door without altering or getting in the way of anything else that had been designed is a tremendous engineering achievement. So why all yeah. the mechanisms are mm -hmm. within that profile. Yep. And and again, these were this the command module is so much smaller than you think it was. Oh my gosh, yeah. It is so surpassingly tiny. Uh, I'll tell you one of the things I was surprised to learn when I was researching spacesuits was that there were lots of people that solved uh, the problem of making suits that were very maneuverable. The only problem is none of them fit inside <laughs> any of the spaceships we were making. And space is a total premium. Every extra square foot of, of breathable air you have to generate is more pressure. It's more uh, pressure on the it's engineering. It, the engineering problems compound with every extra square foot. So they make it as small as possible. And this door was, when you 
the more you research it, the more amazing the engineering achievement becomes. Yeah, it's it's mind boggling. I mean, I've been hyper focused on just the hatch, right, so I know right. more about the hatch than anything else in the whole the whole space shuttle. But uh, what is the what is the most surprising thing you you came across about the hatch in this process? The most surprising thing. Um, I don't know if it's the most surprising, but one thing that I really, really love in my research, I dug deeper into the internet than I have ever dug before. I mean, it was like a month of serious detective work, which was wonderful. Yeah. Uh, there's so much of the stuff online that you can find. Like, NASA's I found phenomenal about that. Yeah. There's like all these archives. I found the 900 page operations manual for the Apollo 11 spacecraft. It's like, <laughs> there's a 900 page book that's like, and then you press this button and then wow. you turn this. It's this. like the Haynes manual. Yeah. Right. <laughs> Um, so in my research, I found all this really amazing stuff, but one of my favorite pictures that I came across is uh, a sort of a wide shot of the manufacturing facility. I think it's, uh, I believe it was North American Rockwell, I think at the time was the name of the company, which has since been acquired and acquired by Boeing. But their facility was in Downey, California, and it's a wide shot of the the whole, the floor. And there are these conical wooden structures made out of plywood that look like oh, cabinets. Yeah. And it's it's prototypes of the command module, but they're in like the most basic everyday materials. Yeah. And for me, as someone who's not an engineer, that was like it just made it more accessible and tangible to be like these people weren't wizards; they were real people that had to solve and figure out all the shapes. And um, that was really cool. And that they was had really the cool cat. Yeah. You specifically called that picture out to me a few weeks ago, and I, I agree with you; it's remarkable, especially because it, it it does make the whole process more accessible. In film, we would. Uh, before we build anything, whether it's a prop or a set, we build a foam core or cardboard mock-up of it in order to get to know it. And again, yeah, you, you you tend to think in the abstract, like, oh, all those brilliant men and women that got us to the moon. And it's like, no, they were just building a whole <laughs> bunch of command modules and seeing which ones were the easiest to fit inside. And that's the only way you can actually do it is to make it and climb in it. Yeah, yeah. Um, and we, I worked on a cardboard prototype of, of just the hatch and the stand here uh, a couple days ago, and I was marveling at how tiny it is. Like, I actually finally built it to scale and stood next to it, and I was like, this is really small. Yeah. And the window is like, you know, it's like a little porthole. It's tiny. And with all those crazy moving parts on it. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> and part of this uh, this project, which spans months, like, the not even like the past time you were here, but even the time before you were here was when you started working on this. Uh, the idea came about because the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum had done scans, right? Mm -hmm. Just like for Armstrong's suit, they had done, uh, I think, it commissioned two different types of scans, a photogrammetry and a LIDAR mm -hmm. scan of the hatch and was seeing if this data set could be useful. Well, they, were, in, they had scanned that. the command module itself and mm -hmm. in doing so had uncovered some wonderful little details, handwritten notes and things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, but they had never gotten around to refining the hatch scan until we reached out and asked if we could have access to that scan, which they generously gave us. And then uh, Ryan Nagata connect us, connected us up with a student named Andrew Barth, mm -hmm. um, who was such a freaking rock star on this project. <laughs> I mean, it, it's he's it, his talent at 3D construction and design and engineering is remarkable uh, also because he's it's only been dawning on him slowly that it's that it's a genuine and abiding skill he possesses yeah. right he's like i didn't know this was that hard and it's like it's beautiful every single one of these mechanical pieces if you wanted to make a working hatch from his drawing i believe you almost could oh you you absolutely could i mean he he put all of the tolerances there for machining and if you go i mean you can you can download this fully functioning model it's a fusion 360 file and the entire every single mechanism articulates the latches you know set off all the linkages all the way around the door and the it, gearbox he put, he oh. tweeted the gearbox the other day he managed to reach out to the smithsonian and find in conjunction with them one of the original mechanical drawings of the gearbox and built it actually i mean it, it's it's jaw dropping yeah and, How and much detail. He, yeah, and he, he you know he based it off of the scan, so it's it's directly modeled off of the the drawings and the original scan data. So it's it's perfectly to scale. I mean, it's as close it's as close as I think we we could ever get to having a real model of a of a piece of space hardware that's that's fully functioning. It's, I mean, it's like it's amazing. Um, I know Andrew is listening and he's building this with us yeah, currently yep, as yep. this is as this is airing, and it's like. Andrew, you did an amazing job. Well, so Andrew, uh, Andrew is one of the collaborators, but there's over 40 other collaborators on this project. Yeah, I think almost 45 uh, other makers that we've 
curated and recruited to represent lots of different mediums and techniques. There's machinists, there's uh, electronics artists, there's woodworkers, and uh, a piece in ceramic. There, it's a wide range of different materials. So it's different than you know when you, uh, we the builders, the past kind mm. of collaborative uh, projects you've done, where the sculptures have been kind of uh, jigsawed together. How did you decide how to split apart? the model that Andrew had done and distribute that between these collaborators? Um, yeah, so we I did a little bit of work to understand who, like, who would be best suited for certain parts. And some of them, you know, it's just a single linkage with three or four components. And then other, like uh, the folks at uh, NYCC and C are made the entire gearbox, which consists of, you know, 20 or so different assemblies. So they, oh you know, we, we divvied it up based on what, what folks' capacity was and what type of facilities they had, um, yeah. I'm just big and small. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm already dreaming about putting together one for myself someday. Someday. By the way, we'll we'll link to the actual downloadable files here below the below the podcast. Um, you can they are publicly available. They are open source. We've released them to the NASA uh, Smithsonian. Have released them to the public. So, and there's already people who've made their own half scale doors, and some people are working on full scale ones too. Yeah, there's uh two. I think at least two that I've seen fully full-scale 3d printed versions of this wow. using the files that andrew created so they're they're out there and you can you can access them online and, and make your own at home and also all of these wonderful collaborators are are we've given them lots of latitude to film photograph and cover in every medium that they choose the build and i've been following it on my twitter feed and it's just been so delightful the enthusiasm of people like uh, jimmy duresta and all these other folks like showing their work and really getting excited about it yeah, yeah, and seeing how different people approach it. Uh, I know, like, for Jimmy's pieces, he 3D printed all of the parts so that he could understand them mechanically and then manufactured them in, in brass and uh, some, like, exotic hardwood. And it's absolutely beautiful, but I heard him talking about it on his podcast, and he was saying, I was terrified when I saw the drawings because it's that mechanically intimidating. And so he he did the three-dimensional uh, print first and then manufactured it. Um, so and I just want to do a shout out, Jen. This has been your baby now for the better part of a year. Yeah, yeah, almost. Um, and yeah, you came up with the title Project Egress, which I totally love. I think it's I think it's the perfect title for this. And you really brought in all of these spaces and, and curated this group. Um, the way in which this draws this community close to help celebrate this incredible thing, um, it moves me and even more I cannot wait till next Thursday when we get together and assemble all 46 pieces of this thing from all across the from all across the globe. We hope it goes okay. We bought a lot <laughs> of tools and glue and double stick tape and things to fix things that might not have worked. I mean, something's going to go Caddy Wampus at some point. Yeah, yeah, and we ran into that with Rosie too. I mean, we're yeah. like sawing off edges of 3D prints and <laughs> placking tape around the arm. I mean, like, well, hopefully it'll be a little a little step above that for the Smithsonian, but we'll what make What type work. of hardware are you guys? Is it going to be nuts and bolts and screwed yep. together? Yeah. Mm -hmm. we're, okay. we're, we're hope, uh, so uh, Microsoft, the Microsoft Product Design Group, um, new friends of mine, have generously contributed a whole bunch. They contributed the base and the, the, the raw frame of mm. the door that we will be bolting to, and they put brass inserts in all the holes on that door frame. That's not to say that everyone's hole patterns are going to perfectly match that. We're going to bring lots of drills. We got hot glue. We got crazy glue. We're we're ready for anything on this. Oh, and we haven't put any restrictions on anybody for the color or paint scheme. Right. This this isn't meant to look exactly like the like the door, and it's not going to function. You're not going to be able to operate the gearbox, but it will. Each each space that's contributed has has chosen their own finish. Yeah, everyone will have a different interpretation, and some of them will be wacky. You so know, I'm, I'm, yeah, struggling to visualize what that is because individually I've seen, yeah. right? But like, yeah, what was that great description someone used that it's like a calico, uh, exquisite corpse? Yeah, like exquisite corpse. You know those things where you fold the paper and draw. And, uh, yeah, it'll be very much like that. We have no idea because we haven't. I've seen individual parts, but we haven't seen them all laid out. No. next to each other so um you and i have a funny history building these things together yeah. because we end up in a in a groove we end up in a groove where we barely speak yep. but our, our brains are running on super parallel tracks uh and I, I i find that groove i have found that groove with certain people over the years jamie heineman is t certainly one of them uh it is a very pleasurable flow state isn't it yeah 
Yeah, and I'm excited to to bring Andrew into that because he he has all of this in his head and he knows more than anyone how all the pieces fit together. So yes. I, I'm curious to see how that all fits together with the three of us working. And we'll be building it live in front of a live audience at the Air and Space Museum. And so. we'll be live streaming that build. Am I, I believe correct? I believe so. Yeah. I yeah. hope so. So all the relevant links will be going yep. up here so you guys can follow along with this. Um, and the Smithsonian's keeping this piece in their collection. We're making yes. a piece for the permanent collection of the Smithsonian. How crazy is that? That's crazy. Um, you know, given how much, you know, like, Tested has talked about the space program and how much we celebrate it here for the ingenuity, uh, it's delightful to get to participate on the ground level with all those folks in D.C. Yeah, it's, I mean, the, the community builds that we've done in the past have kind of been that. You sort of wrap your arms around an entire group of makers and, like, build something together. And that's that's the part that I just, I'm, like, buzzing right now. I'm so excited. Well, and that everyone gets to see it and go, I contributed to that. Yeah, that was I. I was one of the one of the people. That's yeah. that's awesome. I'm blown away by just how many different programs they have going on next week or this week as you're listening to this to celebrate the occasion. There's uh, projection mapping they have announced for uh, Washington Monument. They're projecting a the 500 and some odd foot tall Saturn rocket that took the men to the moon onto the Washington Monument actual size and are doing a digital projection of the of the launch. Yeah, with like smoke and a truck full of speakers. Like I, when they were describing it to me, I was getting goosebumps. It's gonna be phenomenal. And they're doing a whole bunch of these yeah. over the whole week. They're oh. doing it at different times of the day and the night. There's actually one show at 3 a.m. when it's super quiet. I, I'm, I, I don't think I'm gonna get a lot of sleep next week <laughs> in D.C. And I know they did. Uh, they released a, a four to six part documentary series. I think on PBS, though it's under the Smithsonian. And then also the data sets. When you talk about scale, something that Jen you brought up today is the the scan of the not just the hatch but the whole capsule can be now viewed on your phone or tablet in ar so you can right. place it in your environment oh, wow. yeah so you can actually see how it would how it could compare to objects in your room to get a sense of that size mm. yeah you can stand next to it in in ar on your in your phone i did not realize that. yeah we should we should do that we should we should totally do that. That. <laughs> that sounds amazing um we have packed up a bunch of tools over here on the pool table for the trip including my spacesuit. It just feels like it should be with me. Well, if you're not going to be at Comic-Con, you sort of have to do an Adam Incognito somewhere else, right? <sighs> I do. <laughs> I do. It's required. I am not going to Comic-Con for the first time in 12 years. I'm sad about that. But oh, yeah. I'm psyched about why. <laughs> Before we continue on with this episode, I want to let you know that support for Still Untitled comes from Lightstream. You don't have to be a financial expert to know that consolidating debt into a low fixed rate can save you thousands in interest. So pay off your high interest credit cards with a credit card consolidation loan from Lightstream. You can get a rate as low as 5.95 APR with auto pay, which is much lower than the national average interest rate on credit card debt. And get a loan from $5,000 to $100,000 with absolutely no fees. The application is 100% online and you can get your money as soon as the day you apply. I have a bunch of credit cards. I have for work, for personal life, for all sorts of stuff. And yeah, it makes a lot of sense to get it all consolidated and manage under one umbrella. Apply today at lightstream.com slash untitled and get an additional interest rate discount. That's lightstream.com slash untitled for an additional discount. L-I-G-H-T-S-T-R-E-A-M dot com slash untitled. Untitled. Subject to credit approval, rate includes 0.5% auto pay discount. Terms and conditions apply and offers are subject to change without notice. Visit lightstream.com slash untitled for more information. Now back to the conversation. And then in terms of the other things happening, I think we can say that uh, SFMOMA is doing something interesting. They have an exhibit they've uh, announced. Well, the, night, their... the night after, sorry, yeah, so this goes up on the 16th? Yes, uh, the Tuesday. Yep, yeah, that's right. So the 17th is the opening night for an exhibit at the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art uh, curated by Joseph Becker uh, and his team called Far Out mm -hmm. about space habitats from the personal to the global. And uh, it's, it's an exhibit that seeks to explore the way in which we have posited extraterrestrial living. Um, because a spacesuit is a spaceship. And uh, I have contributed four of my suits 
uh, my Aces orange suit, my uh, Mercury suit, my 2001 Clavius suit, and one that we haven't actually shown publicly or talked about that I've been noodling away at for a couple of years, an EMU suit with big EMU gloves made by Like Linda. Um, the actual suit itself was made by NASA back in the early 80s as part of their education department. So it actually has a Teflon coated cloth on the outside. Wow. And then I've gone to heavy lengths to accuratize it. And how long will that be at F SF MoMA? Until January 2020. Oh, cool. So it'll be there for a long time. Uh, we got a chance to, you went visited to watch them do the install. Yes. Which that, I mean, it'll be fun to go once the exhibit's all set up and it's all properly lit, but the install is almost like even more fun. I totally agree. Watching them put lettering on the wall. Yeah, all the vinyl. Put in the yeah. shelves and... They and sent me a note, like, one of the hoses on your 2001 suit has broken. Our archivists suggest this fix. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'm so cavalier with my stuff here in the cave that it's funny to think of them like, oh. <laughs> well, and they, in the most recent one, one day Bill we put out was you making a shadow box for uh, the Radio City Music Hall mm -hmm, earrings, mm -hmm, right? Yes. The, the Rockettes earrings, which, in which you talk about. It's like you love that idea of how things, how artifacts are displayed in museums. Yes. That is all they do. Right. Right. How the interaction between the object and the viewer, but then how it also preserves the integrity of the object and how it lives alongside the objects next to it. How it helps the object tell its own story. I Every time I see a little custom holder for a bit of ceramic or some war club or badge, and it, the, you can tell that someone has lovingly made this brass holder that grips it in just so... I'm thrilled by that. I think about that interaction. Um, Anil Dash from Glitch talks, uh, he, the phrase they use in, in, at Glitch is, imagine the meeting. Imagine the group of people getting together to solve this problem. Yeah. And, and the meeting of the objects themselves, too, because while you have the four suits there, they're arranged in a way alongside other suits, mm -hmm. which is a way where you've never been able to yeah. see your suits. Oh, and they also have a three-foot diameter model of the space station from 2001, lovingly built by Steve Neal. In what I think was like 40 days flat, it what? was crazy. Um, Oh, these very few people could have turned this thing out to this level of accuracy. I mean, he actually made a section of the space station so that he could cast it and group up the castings, and the castings failed. And so halfway through the project, he had to scratch build it out of styrene. He built it twice. Oh, my gosh. It's hung up uh, above the exhibit, but it's one of those pieces that wherever it ends up, like, it deserves to be a thing you can walk around. And, and get it's up lit close on to. the inside and the, the Pan Am plane is flying yeah, into the, the space poster. station like the it, poster from oh, 2001. Man. Well, when we get back from DCA, I know where I'm going to go yeah. check out. Yeah. No, I'm sad I won't be there for the opening. Oh, there's too, yeah, there's too many good things happening <laughs> too, at once. Too many good things at once. Um, um, we are about halfway through the airing run for Savage Builds, of which you were one of the key, key builders on it. Um, I'm loving looking at your at your social media feed, at the pictures you have on your phone, because they're so different than the ones I take. Yeah, everyone's different perspective from where you know where they were working at during the during the build. So um, it'll happen. I'm just going through my Twitter feed. I'm like, oh, that looks familiar. Oh, it's, it's from my shoot. <laughs> <That's> <laughs> or I'm going, that side. looks interesting. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, it's been fun. I, I have so many awesome pictures. You know, there's a lot, a lot of time when you like you build the thing, and then once the cameras are rolling, there's a lot of kind of standing around waiting for things to be needed. So. Yeah document document the process and everything that's happening but i haven't been able to share them with anyone so as i see the episodes coming up i'm like oh now i can tell show people this cool thing that we were working on but it's delightful i uh, uh we threw you in the deep end on that on that show <laughs> uh it was it was a new one for me i mean i've <laughs> i've never worked on a tv show before definitely and there's a lot of the the crew have been working together w with you for years yeah and so i was very much the green person on set um, it's a good family, though. I, I knew yeah. you'd be well well cared for. Uh, everyone is amazing, and I learned like every single day was like learning. It was like information overload. I was learning so much, <laughs> like but a it, fire hose. Yeah, yeah, but it was a blast. So this is kind of always what I've wanted to do. So I mean, it looked like so much different types of problem solving, but also different every week. Like you go from putting the arc reactor light in Iron Man and mm -hmm. lights behind the panels of of that right yeah. there right mm -hmm. uh pieces on the the mag max inspired cars right the, the targets and stuff like that it's just the, the gamut of things that fabricate yeah yeah it definitely was was an interesting challenge and the weather really really screwed us <laughs> the weather was such a nightmare we had all these you know you have all this planning and timelines and when you're going to do shoots and then just it poured for like three months straight at the beginning of the year it poured and we should let you know that you'll notice that i'm rarely in a t-shirt in the, for the first five or six episodes and that's because 
it was freaking cold <laughs> in that shop. Like, so cold. We would have, like, cheese as a snack, like, one afternoon, and then we'd just leave it on the table because we were basically working in a refrigerator. Yes. Yeah. So things didn't go bad. Uh, yeah, the, the first, like, three days we were on set, I didn't bring a, a real winter coat because I didn't, I used to the East Coast, I didn't think I needed it. I was like, it doesn't get that cold here. <laughs> and the first three days, I, like, borrowed a coat from my roommate and then went over to Community Thrift and found, like, a really nice down jacket that I wore every single day on set because, it, <laughs> yeah, it was, a, it was an ice box in there. God, it's nonstop. And I, I remind myself, because this episode is airing the week after we record this, the episode of Savage Builds coming out this week is nitroglycerin no, uh, as we record this nitroglycerin then, is what will have just aired when you're listening exactly to this so this friday as you're listening to this uh i don't have you have you announced i don't know what is it oh it's it's the thing sitting right there oh it's the zf2 okay all right yes <laughs> yeah so yeah the after nitroglycerin the episode that will air is my build of the zf1 from the fifth element the egg gun that shoots six different things nets Arrows, flames, ice, bullets, and a ro- an exploding tipped rocket. Um, we made one. We attempted to do our best to make one that actually functioned in every way to the original. And um, <laughs> how close we got is a story in and of itself. I'm I'm really excited to see the episode. <laughs> this was one where we did a we did a whole day of beauty shots of of just showing it off in that beautiful warehouse space down yeah. on Gerald it was great. Um, yeah, it's, it's interesting to watch the episodes f- a few months later because it's a totally different perspective and all, you know, the magic of editing and all this stuff. And we never get to really see it from, from that, that side of the camera. You yeah. just kind of yeah. deliver the baby and watch it grow up. And now, now we're getting to see it. Uh, it's, it's really awesome to, to come back around. We also have a, a, a celebrity guest star on the ZF1 episode, Gary Oldman, who famously played Zorg in The Fifth Element. Um, he couldn't come to set, so we engineered a Skype call, uh, and he was generous enough to share how he invented the voice of Zorg in conjunction with Luc Besson. Uh, oh, yeah. Wow. And he talked about what it was like to fire the flamethrower and fire the various things on set and the ways... I mean, he had phenomenal stories my whole crew we shot our piece here in san francisco and then uh my son thing too went down to uh gary's house and filmed with him there and my crew everyone had hearts coming out of their eyes by the (laughs) end gary was so generous and so sweet um he and i have known each other for years because he's a maker he's a maker and he builds things and paints things and he's always getting his hands dirty he's an avid photographer uh he's got a lot of wonderful hobbies and we do have an extended plan to build something together one day we just have oh. not gotten around to it i love i love the secret makers that i have met over the years like yeah it's awesome we'll consider them this episode phase one of that plan precisely of <laughs> yes of a long-term yeah. plan and uh, and on the site uh this coming monday next monday We'll have another video with some close-up details after Savage Built airs awesome. uh, of the ZF2, so you can get a close look at that. Yeah, we've lined it up next to the ZF1. I'm not sure that happens uh, in great detail in the actual episode. Mm. I'm looking forward to it. Oh, and so uh, as recording this, you're days away from flying out. What, what are the last things that need to be done? Um, We're actually figuring out which bags to distribute to whom in order to get there without (laughs) incurring ridiculous baggage fees. Because we have a lot of tools, costumes, pieces, logistics, materials to take with us uh, to make sure this build goes smoothly. I'm sorry for the clicking. I can't stop playing with this magnet. I apologize. It's all my fault. (laughs) (laughs) There we go. Magnet gone. And we have camera crews going to D.C. We have camera crews going to San Diego with me. So we're going to have a ton of this content uh, rolling out on the site. Um, Like I am... I'm envious of all of us, everything we're doing uh, next week. So. You're go- are you going to get some time in San Diego to do a photo? I hope so. Like, yeah. This, yeah, this yeah. is really yeah, important. Yeah. I, yeah. I miss those when you don't I, get to I, do I a think photo I'll, one. I, you know, we're there fewer days this year, but I, I think I'm going to definitely spend some time. Kishore's going to be down there with me. I'm going to hang out with him. I'll probably meet up with Frank down there. He's good. Kishore's getting his costume. I saw him last night at the Exploratorium. He's like rapidly getting his costume cosplay he, stuff together. He is into it. Yeah. Yeah. I've got a costume. Actually, I've got a costume from Savage Builds that we purchased for the show that uh, is going to Kishore because oh, it's one he's oh, been really? wanting to do for a while. Yeah. I'm not going to tell anyone. <laughs> He'll just reveal it at, in his own time. All right. Kishore Incognito. Yes. <laughs> All right. Um, 
Well, thank you so much. Good luck to both of you. Thank you. Thanks. It's going to be so much fun. I can't wait. <laughs> and we'll get a full uh, debriefing of how everything went when we get back. Thanks, awesome. guys. See you next week.